Welcome boys and girls to the flippity flip flop flip class video. This is the fun one that you get to do over vacation. When you guys come back in, we'll be ready to talk in depth about John Tuzo Wilson and the Wilson Cycle. Some interesting facts about John Wilson. John Wilson is the scientist who pioneered discoveries such as the transform plate boundary. People did not know about that until he discovered it which is pretty interesting. In addition to that, uh, you'll notice the timeline. He was around during the periods of, say, Continental Drift Theory and Alfred Wegener, and was also survived long enough to, to go through the 60s and see seafloor spreading and see his vindication. So he was actually one of the forefront arguers for the theory of continental drift, for that whole idea, one of the proponents of it for years. And so it was very gratifying for him, even though Wegener was long since dead, to actually see that idea set in motion. On top of that, he also uh, came up with what's called the Wilson Cycle, which pertains to the formation of the ocean. It all has to do with that whole plate tectonic movement thing. I'm talking about the P word. I'm talking about Pangea. You know, the big supercontinent thing that you talk about in middle school for on and on until no end. Well, anyway, his idea goes along with Pangea. So if you click this uh, link right here, if you're on YouTube, you can click the annotation. If you're on Vimeo, it's going to be in the description down below. Go ahead and click on that one. You can actually watch a really nice time lapse to give you a review of how uh, the whole Pangea thing worked. But essentially, you have the supercontinent that it broke apart and turned into how the world looks today, which is kind of interesting, except uh, where's the ocean come in? That's what I want to know. So... Here's a nice picture, and it's showing you the uh, late Proteozoic era, which is 650 million years ago. And this is basically showing you sort of a precursor's aftermath of Pangaea. You can see in the outline, this is showing you uh, all the continents that are around today and showing you where Pangaea used to be. For example, there's China, Australia, the Antarctic, which is all kinds of fun. And this is basically showing you a nice giant landmass. You can see uh, later on of which blue doesn't work very well with the blue on blue, later which became uh, the world as we know it today. The really fun ones is they're showing you this line right here for the meteorology students that is not some kind of weird cold or warm front that is actually showing a subduction zone and geology students know that one already. When you see it that way it shows you the subduction zone. Again you have this ocean so the question is where did the ocean come from? That's where the Wilson cycle comes in. Now, essentially, once upon a time, the Earth, such as this Earth, didn't look the way it looks today. It was just a big, molten ball of rock. And let's say, for argument's sake, it's a big, solid piece of rock, and it's been that way for a little while. Uh, what happens first is you get some mantle upwelling right in this area here. So you have mantle upwelling, and it's already, sh already showing you the, the beginning features of a volcano wouldn't be a seamount because it's going to be on the Earth's surface because as of yet there is no ocean. Now while this is happening you've got volcanism, you've got off-gassing from the Earth. As the Earth is cooling it's actually releasing all this water vapor and all these really nasty gases and especially out of volcanoes you get a lot of sulfur and a lot of uh, chlorine. In fact chlorine uh, measuring uh, chloride six ions is actually how we measure the salinity of the ocean today. And so basically, we're putting out all the parts that will later be into the ocean. It's very, very acidic. And so it evaporated, all this moisture came up, and it off gas, and basically made an atmosphere that would be very similar to Venus. And while it's doing that, it's going to be uh, you know, raining constantly. So it's raining constantly with this highly acidic rain that's so acidic that it can actually melt rock. And I'm not talking like melt rock because it's hot. I mean like acid rain, like, eh, it's not bad for my crops. I mean, it's like melting the rock rock like blah that's bad and so as a result the earth pretty much looks like this at this point point. Yeah. and so essentially if you were to look at it on a round surface this is how the earth would look you have the earth it's very round and just to keep everything simple let's just say that it just the mantle upwelling just starts in the one spot which would be right there so the mantle uh, is coming up, all that magma is doing, you know, magma thing, convection currents, yada, 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 the normal stuff that we know about. And it creates a delicious divergent boundary right here. There it is, divergent boundary with a big old uh, volcano. This is how every ocean begins with a divergent boundary. 
A uh, good example of the Red Sea uh, and the East African Rift is actually forming. It's going to split Africa off of the rest of Africa and make an ocean there. So once it gets pulled apart, you have that pull apart faulting, you get these drop block faults that you see right in here, the drop block faulting that you can see right there. And that's just basically showing uh, how we're going to create the big valley for the ocean to be inside of. So basically, first you got to dig a big hole. And then remember, while this is happening, the Earth is still very young. We're still having this torrential downpour of acid, nastiness, all the ponds. So it's angry water. It's ferocious water. Angry eyebrows on the water. Yeah, there we go. And so it's raining, it's raining, it's raining, and it's starting to make a really big hole that eventually will be filled with that water that has melted bits of rock in it, and that is why the ocean is salt water instead of fresh water. So the question you're probably asking, we mentioned sulfur, we mentioned chlorine, which is totally in the water a lot. Where did the magnesium and sodium come from? Magnesium and iron are the primary constituents in basalt rock, and then there's also granite and other types of rock that were formed on the Earth's surface, some of the more felsic, some of the less dense rock. And so all that rock that was dissolved by the acid rain, that's where the magnesium, that's where the chlorine, or that's where the sodium came from. So eventually, so essentially you've been spreading here, you've been spreading, spready, spready, spready. The asthenosphere is still welling up to the top, so you still have volcanism in this area. But, as you can see here, we now have a large ocean basin to be filled with water. And so if you look at the Earth now, but essentially this is what you have. You start forming a big ocean up here at the top. You have a big ocean up here at the top. And the rest, here's our ocean, and the rest of the world is just one gigantic jumbified continent. All right. As it continues, you get more and more upwelling. It starts building rock upon rock because that's what happens when the magma comes up to the surface becoming lava and gets all upon the water. So you start forming your mid-ocean ridge here. The spreading continues to happen and the rock over here is getting really piling up on itself, turning into continental crust. And you have one big ocean in the middle. For example, you could think of this like the Atlantic Ocean with Europe and the Americas on side by side. And if we look at the Earth, the Earth will look alike this. We have a nice big ocean, but, you know, nothing really new to see there except for a mid-ocean ridge right there. But I do want to draw your attention to the bottom portion of the Earth. Because remember, the Earth is round, so when we have spreading, when we're spreading here and here, it's going to keep going around, keep going around, and that rock has to go somewhere. It's going to pile up on top of itself in a continental, continental convergent boundary over here. So we have a continental, continental convergent boundary, and so we're starting to build mountains and really, really, you know, big land masses over here on the other side of the Earth. And as it continues to go and continues to go, eventually, nowadays, that ocean is going to run into land, which is happening right over here. So the ocean has run into the land. There it is running into the land, and as you can see, when the ocean runs into the land, uh, it subducts under. You get uh, a nice... Uh, arc of volcanoes over there, and then you still have the ocean over here on the other side. And at this point, the Earth is starting to look like this. What's really kind of fun is you can actually have so much uh, magma come up that just like in the Pacific, making all those islands, you can actually have it start to make mid-ocean ridge that will protrude out of the ocean. And you can see that the Earth is starting to look almost half ocean half ocean, half land. So we've got half ocean, down here we have half land, and that looks strikingly similar to, well you guessed it, Pangaea. Until eventually there's a rebound. And this is where you have to think about the physicality of rocks. So what's kind of interesting about rocks is even though we think of them as being solid rocks, they've got this plasticity to them, they've got this give and take. And so essentially if you look at the earth you start spreading, you start spreading, you start spreading, you start spreading. As it spreads, it continues to go around the world, like this one is going around the world, until it gets to the other side, all the way down there in the Antarctica, and it comes together, and it builds up until it reaches a point of elastic rebound, and then it's going to blast back apart. And that's the point that we have now reached. It continues subducting, continues getting pushed down there, until eventually down here, it can't take the pressure anymore. You get elastic rebound, 
which sends it back the other way. You'll notice that that is going to create, down here on the bottom, it's going to create another rift valley. And in creating our next rift valley, we're now preparing the way for our second ocean. So you have that continental, continental collision. It will rebound, fire around the other way. And you notice it's called a Wilson cycle because, as the picture shows here, it's actually happened in a cycle. The supercontinent you're always taught about is Pangaea. Here's, here's Pangaea, right here, in the ballpark of, you know, 300 to 100 million years ago, there was Pangaea. What they don't tell you is that original supercontinent, where we went from that inner ocean phase, very early Earth, building mountains, we actually had a supercontinent before that supercontinent, before Pangaea, that supercontinent is called Rodinia. So we actually have Rodinia came before Pangaea. So essentially, the, the Wilson cycle has already happened two full times. The spreading happened and went all the way around the world, making Rodinia, and then Rodinia rebounded and split apart and started coming back around the rest of the world, which turned into the uh, apart time, which would be looking similar to how the Earth looks today. You have two major hemispheres with massive continents. And then it continues to go until it comes to the other side of the world again, it smashes all together back into Pangaea, and then the pressure builds and pressure builds, you make these huge mountains and bam, it pushes apart until it looks exactly the way the world looks today. What's really fun, we are exactly here at year zero with our delicious Atlantic Ocean that formed right up the middle from Pangaea, splitting uh, Europe and America and Africa and South America from each other. But what's really cool about this is that it's going to keep on going. And even if you look at the map, here's us, and if you follow us up here into the Alaska area, you'll notice that Alaska and Russia are like all the ponds. And eventually, uh, the whole Pacific plate will be subducted underneath those two continents as the west coast of America and the east coast of Asia and Eurasia smash into each other, making the next great supercontinent. You want to say it'd be Rodinia, Pangaea, Rodinia, Pangaea, but instead it's going to be Pangaea and then Pangaea Ultima. And that is the future of our world. So, all you have to do is survive another 200 million years and then you can see the next great supercontinent. Thanks for watching, everybody.